This week, Jews around the world are going to celebrate the holiday of Pesach. And it's the first holiday that we're told about in the Torah. It's the first holiday in the Jewish calendar. Jewish calendar is a little bit confusing because it, there's a calendar that runs in the order of months and there's a calendar that runs in the order of years. So like in the Gregorian calendar, the year starts in January and the first month is January. In the Torah calendar, it's a little bit different because the first month is the month of Nisan, the month that we're in right now. But the years begin in Tishrei, which is in six months from now. So if you ever get that confusion, like why is Rosh Hashanah in the sixth month? Why is the beginning of the year in the sixth month? That's the answer. And of course, uh, Pesach is Passover is the commemoration of the event that marks the beginning and the birth of our nation. You read the whole book of Genesis, and there's exactly three mitzvahs. There's the mitzvah of be fruitful and multiply. There's the mitzvah of bris meal of circumcision. And there's the mitzvah of not eating from the sciatica. And if you would imagine, like, okay, we have 613 mitzvahs and five books to convey them. There would be about 120 or so in each book. Yet the book of Genesis has exactly three. And the first 12 chapters of Exodus has exactly zero. But once we hit this critical juncture where the Exodus is now happening, there is a whole bunch of mitzvahs. And it doesn't end essentially till the end of, of Deuteronomy. And the answer is because something very significant happens at this transformation, at the point where the Jewish people that burgeoned into a whole nation, they become a the official Jewish nation, perhaps even the official chosen people. All this happens on Pesach. As a general introduction to the to the festival, this is the time when the Jewish people were formed. And thus, not only is it a significant holiday, it's a significant festival that we're celebrating every year, but it's a festival that really reveals what the essence of the Jewish people are. And I think these ideas maybe could be a little bit confusing, that there's, you know, we say we're the chosen nation. And that sounds like we have feelings of superiority over others. That's what it sounds like. And, but it's, it's not defined. What does it mean, chosen? Nate, what does that even mean? And I think if we study exactly all the various moving parts of the holiday of Passover, of Pesach, and we really uncover what it is that we stand for and what our value is as a nation, I think a lot of these things fall into place. Just to prove my point that the founding of the nation was at the Exodus and not prior, there is a verse that we say several times a day, and it is part of the Shema, the Shema, the end of the Shema, the third chapter of the Shema. It says, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt to be for you a God. Thus, the relationship of the Jewish people as the nation of God, when does that kick start? At the Exodus. Moreover, in the Ten Commandments, the very first of the Ten Commandments, that I'm Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. So it's almost like the defining characteristic of our relationship with the Almighty is that he took us out of the land of Egypt. Now, he did a lot of things. Created the world, takes care of us today, took care of us in the past. But what really defines the Jewish relationship with the Creator, that is that he took us out of the land of Egypt. He selected us from amongst the people of Egypt. And therefore, we'd see these increase of, of mitzvos that really begin over here in earnest once the Jewish people are in the process of the Exodus, and that is because what this relationship, when there's a creator and there is a creature who is created, and the Almighty gives us a commandment, that really typifies what this relationship is. He gives us instructions, and we obey them. And we also have the benefit of being given very clear guidance from above. Thus, it's no coincidence that mitzvahs really begin 
once the Exodus is about to begin, because that is when we are being selected as a nation, and the mitzvah is what symbolizes our nation. So that's kind of a general introduction. But I think more broadly, we look at the Exodus, and it's not only mentioned on Pesach. In fact, there is a holiday exactly six months before and after Pesach called Sukkot or Sukkot. Why do we celebrate the holiday of Sukkot? Because of the Exodus. It's almost as if we have exactly halfway through the year, exactly six months after we, after the holiday of Pesach, we have Sukkot, and after Sukkot we have Pesach. It's almost as if that we can't go more than six months without remembering the Exodus. Both Sukkot and Passover are, are seven days to dwell on the Exodus. There's a week, two weeks out of the year, we're told to stop our normal routine and to spend seven days, spend a whole week, ruminating, dwelling, pondering, thinking about the Exodus. Obviously, it's not just a remembrance of some historical event. It's something that's really important today. The truth is, it's not just the holidays that are a remembrance from the Exodus. And it's not only Pesach and Sukkot. It's also Shavuos. And it's also Rosh Hashanah. And it's also Yom Kippur. But it's also every single Shabbos we say, Zechel Yitzhiyas Mitzvah. And in fact, there's many, many mitzvos that have a touch point with this central event of our nation, the founding event of our nation, where we became a people at the Exodus. So what I want to, I want to try to do is, I want to try to develop an idea that really explains the whole notion of the Exodus and the deeper meaning behind Pesach. But it's really a discussion about what we stand for as, as a people and as a nation. So the first place that the Exodus is mentioned in the Torah is way before the Exodus actually happened. In fact, it's in the book of Genesis. And at the end of Genesis, of course, the Jewish people are already a big family. Jacob has 12 sons and a daughter, and they each have their own family. And that's it's a significant population. It's not just Abraham or Isaac. It's not, it's not just one person. Now there's a whole family. And the family ends up in Egypt. However, at the end of the book of Genesis, they're not yet enslaved. They are, in fact, part of Egyptian royalty. Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, is like the vice president, the viceroy, the vizier of Egypt. He's the one who comes up with all these creative solutions to stave off the years of famine. And he brings his whole family there as well. If you just read the book of Genesis, you would say the Jews are going to flourish very well in the, their new homeland. That's what you would think. You open up the book of Exodus in the very first chapter, the Jews are proliferating and they are raising the ire of the local indigenous population. And they, uh, the Egyptians, come up with ways to subjugate them and eventually enslave them. And that's the way they remain for hundreds of years. But in the beginning of the book of Genesis, we meet Abraham. And Abraham marks a transformation in the direction of humanity. You you had Adam prior and he messes up and, and you had the generation of Noah and that's an absolute debacle. And then you have the generation of the dispersion and that's a disaster. And things really seem to be going poorly for humanity. It comes along Abraham and there's paradigm shift. Abraham recognizes God. Abraham introduces God to the masses. Abraham goes on a mission of proselytization, of trying to in- infuse the world with knowledge of God. And there's a series of promises that God gives back in return. So four times Abraham has promised that he's going to have the land of Israel. But in addition, he's promised that his children will be God's people and God's selected people and God's chosen people. And of course, it's not a coincidence because Abraham chose God and chose to commit himself to the mission of bringing God to the world. Therefore, God says back in reciprocity, I'm going to choose you and choose your descendants to actually do that, to be the chosen people. So it's not like we happen to have won the lottery to be God's people. It's we just happen to be descendants of Abraham, who was the one who accepted upon himself the sacred mission of bringing God into the world, of doing what we call tikkun olam, fixing and improving the world. But in chapter 
15 of the book of Genesis, in one of those promises where God says to Abraham, okay, I like you, I'm going to keep you, you're going to be my, you're going to be my guy, you're going to be the father of my nation. He tells him something very surprising. He tells him, Yodoa Teta, you should surely know, you should surely know that your descendants, that I'm promising to be the chosen people, the chosen nation, the nation that's going to stand for what you stand for, the nation that's going to complete what you began, they're going to be slaves in a foreign land, and they're going to be tormented for 400 years. However, as a consolation prize, when they leave, they'll leave with great wealth, and I'm going to judge the nation that enslaves them. And this kind of really doesn't fit into the whole context. We're in the book of Genesis. Abraham doesn't even have any children yet. All he has is a promise that you're going to have a, you're going to be a father of a great nation. And Abraham is told good news. You're going to have a nation. They're going to be my people, the chosen people. This is your dreams that you are starting right now are going to be actualized over the course of history. However, just as a caveat, it's not going to be super smooth. Your children will surely, you should know for sure, this is guaranteed. You should surely know. It means this part is non-negotiable. This part, there's no way to avert this. You should surely know that your descendants will be foreigners in a foreign land. They're going to be enslaved. They're going to be tormented for 400 years. When they leave, it'll be okay. 400 years later, don't worry. I think if we, we kind of zoom out, look at the big picture here. We think of the Egyptian exile, as it's called in Jewish literature, the, the Egyptian enslavement or servitude, we think of that as happenstance. There was a really evil pharaoh. He used to be really bad to us. Oh, but okay, we have the Exodus. Here we're told in Genesis, all this is preordained. Moreover, it's a prerequisite to everything else that follows. There's no way around it. You have to know this for sure. This is set in stone. As a condition of you being the father of the chosen people, the chosen people have to go through this process in order to emerge as God's nation. So not only is the exodus, that that, that transformation where the Jewish people become a nation, but the entire slavery, this 400-year process, is actually necessary to achieve that. And this is kind of like, it's like a bizarre thing. It really reframes the whole holiday. The holiday is not just about we became a nation when we left. As a condition to become the nation, we have to go in. And that seems very, very bizarre. Why must the Jews endure and undergo such harsh torment and enslavement and really horrific treatment in the hands of the Egyptians or in the foreign foreign nation in order to achieve the nationhood. Why couldn't the nationhood have been formed in some other way? So in the book of Deuteronomy, we find uh, Moshe, it's basically for the most part, it is Moshe's very big speech that he's giving. The, the first part of Deuteronomy, the first part of Deuteronomy is Moshe's speech to the nation. Moshe is about to die and they're about to, he's about to hand over the reins of the leadership to Joshua and he wants to prepare the Jewish people for everything that's, that they're going to encounter once they enter the land of Israel and all the challenges they're going to face. And he's looking backwards in history and looking also forwards to the future. What's And he's trying to use that to guide the people. So one of the verses, it comes amid a whole speech, but it's it has a description of, of the Exodus. So one of the verses, it's in chapter 4, verse 20, and it talks about, what the Exodus was like. And it describes, and you, God, took, and he took you out from the iron crucible, from the Kur HaBarazel, from Egypt, to be for him as a nation, a nation of heritage as this very day. And Rashi there explains, what is this idea of it, that the Egyptian situation with the Jewish people was like an iron crucible. Rashi says, what's an iron crucible? Iron crucible is a device, a vessel that is used to purify gold. If you have gold that's not pure, you put in the crucible, you put a huge fire like thousands of degrees, and that is able to purify and separate 
the problematic or the, the unrefined elements from the gold. That's what Rashi says, and that's what how he explains the verse. So this is an interesting, it's just a tremendous insight. The Jewish people were golden. We, we, were, we, were, we were gold, but not pure gold. There were slight imperfections that needed purification. And thus, when we look at the, just in this prism, the Egyptian exile, the Egyptian enslavement was painful. Just like you would imagine it's painful for the gold to be in, in the fire. But ultimately, there's a net positive benefit because the gold enters unrefined and exits refined. That's what the verse is telling us. What it's telling us essentially is that there's something very constructive that was achieved during this 400-year process. It wasn't just the Almighty will save you and it's only good at the end. Suffer now because it'll be good at the end. No, you're suffering now, but ultimately this is for your betterment because this is improving your situation by refining you. Perhaps we could say, God's telling Abraham, you're gold. And we assume that your children, your grandchildren will be golden too. However, to be the nation of God and to be the chosen people, you have to be refined gold. You have to be perfected gold. And to do the only way to do that, you should surely know that your children will be foreigners in foreign land. They'll be enslaved for several hundred years and then they'll leave with the Exodus and that will be their taking out of their pure gold and getting ready for nationhood. So this is, this is an interesting idea that there's something really positive about the Egyptian experience that even though at the time was quite painful, but ultimately it equaled a purification process for the nation. So it's not hard for us to see how the Exodus itself was very valuable. What this is telling us is that there's something, an idealized version of the Jewish nation. There's a nation at its peak, at its zenith, at its acme, that this is something that this is what we're looking for. And, and God is telling Abraham, let's look to the future. When this nation is ready to be the chosen people of God, there's something that we're trying to achieve and to get to, but the only way to do that is through this iron crucible. So what I want to try to understand now, in light of those introductions, let's try to go through the Egyptian exile story and try to see, well, what, what happened to them? They became slaves. Well, how, how does becoming a slave, how does that improve the nation's ability to be the Jewish people? So let's, let's start with the beginning of Exodus. Beginning of Exodus, we get very little about, first chapter is about the enslavement process. We're told that Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, and his cohorts, they concocted a plan to enslave the Jewish people, and they executed that plan. And things were really bad. Things were really terrible. But as the Jewish people, the more they were beaten, the more they grew, the stronger they got, which, again, should be like a little bit of a hint to future things, that even though they're being enslaved, they're getting stronger, not weaker, which seems to be counterintuitive. Anyhow. Chapter 2, we meet, we meet Moshe, and Moshe essentially is going to be guiding us the rest of the way. Moshe grows up, he's a great hero, he stands up for his brethren, he has to flee, and he ends up trying to save the daughters of Yisro, he gets married, and he's separate from the Jewish people, he's in Midian. Chapter 3, we read about Moshe in the burning bush, and that begins a whole negotiation and dialogue back and forth where God tells Moshe to go save the Jewish people. And if we study that story... That's the first time we really get some more some more detail about the, the about the plans. God tells them, and this this again is a is a theme, a motif that repeats itself again and again throughout the Exodus story. Pharaoh's not going to relent. I'm going to harden his heart. There's going to be a lot of fanfare, a lot of miracles before the Exodus actually happens. Of course, Moshe himself demurs. He says, uh, "Don't send me. I'm not qualified. Send someone else." And Aaron, uh, well, the Jewish people won't listen to me that we learn about Moshe's character. But the general plan here is there's going to be a very dramatic exodus. Pharaoh's going to be hard, his heart's going to be hardened. Egyptians will know that I am God. These things repeat themselves again and again throughout the entire story. Finally, Moshe is convinced to go tell the Jewish people and he goes, reaches out to them and they don't want to listen to him because they are so hard worked. 
they, they, they don't have the ability to even hear what he has to say. What does that tell us about the status of the nation? It tells us that they have almost reached the point of, of, of no return. They're slaves to Pharaoh and they cannot conceive any other sort of reality. Moshe comes and says, we're going to have freedom. We're going to have – we're going to go back to being a nation. We're going to go back to being a people. We're going to be able to march out of here. God's going to save us and it falls in deaf ears. And I think that's an important juncture milestone in the story because it tells us what the state of the nation is. They are such slaves of Pharaoh that they are almost losing their own independence in their mind. If someone is enslaved, then in their head, they could still be planning their escape and they could still be planning their revenge and they could still be hoping for a better future. But it seems like the enslavery and the dominion of Pharaoh permeated their hopes and their hearts and their minds, and even this dream of a better future, that there's no place for it to grab hold of in their imagination. What essentially the Jewish people had become were total slaves. We are given a snapshot into the mindset of the people at this point. Right before the Exodus, they're total slaves of Pharaoh. And it seems like now they're ready. Because that's now is when the whole engine of the Exodus begins. So what happens? God tells Moshe, go tell Pharaoh. We're going to do, uh, if you don't send the Jewish people out, all these terrible things are going to happen to you. And of course, there's the 10 plagues and the Torah details. Everything happens with these 10 plagues. And each time Pharaoh's like, oh, we're all going to die. We'll send, you, we'll send you out. And then he, of course, changes his mind. And after five plagues, the first five plagues, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And God says, you know what? Even if he is willing to relent, we're going to temporarily suspend his free will. He's going to lose his ability to say no. He's going to lose his ability to send you out. And we're going to have to have these rest of these, of these plagues. Now, this tells us something very important. This tells us that the plagues are not incidental to the Exodus. They are, in fact, necessary. They, they are part and parcel of the Exodus. It's not just a way to force Pharaoh's hand to let you go. Well, if so, well, then after Pharaoh wants to let you go, that's it. What it tells us is the plagues are part of the bigger picture and they have to happen. All ten plagues have to happen. And Pharaoh thus has to be negated. We cannot allow Pharaoh's free will to suspend or, or to disrupt the... Ten plagues that have to happen. These are not just ten ways to pummel Pharaoh until he relents. The fact that he's relenting is totally immaterial. These are ten plagues that have a different independent function. Now, the Torah tells us three times that in order that Pharaoh shall know that I am God. It seems like the objective of the plagues is that Pharaoh and the Egyptians and Pharaoh's people and Pharaoh's palace and administration knows that I am God. And this seems, again, very bizarre. If the objective of the Exodus is the Jewish people become a nation of God, is that we go through some sort of iron crucible that culminates in our redemption, why are we talking so much about Pharaoh? That Pharaoh has to know something. Who cares about Pharaoh? Aren't we fleeing Pharaoh? Doesn't the story move away from Pharaoh? We don't hear about Pharaoh after the Exodus. Yes, of course, there's this plane in the sea, and maybe Pharaoh, that story is invoked later on to look back at the story. But the objective should be the Jewish people. And it doesn't say that the Jewish people should know that I am God. It says that Pharaoh will know that I am God. Again, very, very strange. So I want, I want to suggest the key to understanding and unlocking this entire quagmire, and again, broadly speaking, the key to understanding what we stand for as a nation and thus to understand what happened at the Exodus and what was being developed for 400 years from Abraham to the Exodus. So I want to begin by asking another question. This is maybe an oblique way to get there, but hear me out. There is a commandment 
that after a Jewish slave is enslaved for six years, you have to let him go. We find that in the book of Exodus. However, if the Jewish slave loves it so much, they want to stay, they could stay. They could stay forever. But first they have to have their ear pierced. Really strange thing. So Rashi says, what's going on here? What's this idea that the ear uh, of the Jewish slave is pierced? And he says something very novel. He says, because the ear that heard at Sinai, you are God's slaves. Therefore, you're slaves of God and not slaves of God's slaves, not slaves of people. Therefore, there's something wrong with the ear of, of this slave, and therefore we have to puncture it. There's something wrong. It's obviously, it's not working as, as intended. Put aside this whole context. What, what does this tell us? It tells us that at Sinai, God gave us a message. What was the overarching message of Sinai? You are servants of God. You're slaves of God. Now, I actually looked through the whole Sinai description, and nowhere can I find this citation that we are servants of God. It doesn't say it actually anywhere in the entire Sinai description. But it doesn't say it explicitly, but it's implicit in everything that we find in the entire Torah. There are no suggestions in the Torah. It's not the Ten Suggestions. It's the Ten Commandments. Who is God to give us commandments? Why is God telling us? Why is he dictating what we should do? Thus, it's clear that God is saying, I'm in charge. You're my subordinates. You're subject to my will. I give commandment. You must obey. What does that sound like? That sounds like a master dictating to a servant. And thus, aptly, we could say that at Sinai, when we started getting the mitzvahs, the whole idea of a mitzvah, of a commandment, reveals the underlying relationship between the commander and the recipient of that commandment. If it was just God giving us good advice, how to win friends and influence people, then it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a mitzvah. It would be something else. It's good advice. This, follow this if you wish. If you don't want, choose, else, choose other stuff. And that's not the whole Torah. Commandments, commandments, commandments. That essentially reveals the relationship between the Jew and God is that God is the master and we're the servant. And thus, if the servant says, I want to remain a servant to another human, there's something wrong. He didn't get the Sinai message. But I think that this reveals what the essence of the Jewish nation is and how we got there through the initial servitude and the ensuing redemption and exodus. So this gives us, I think, a, a, a very tight definition of what we are as a nation. We are a nation of servants of God. And once we understand that, let's go back to Abraham. Abraham is foretold, your descendants will be the chosen nation. What does it mean, the chosen nation? It means the nation that are servants of God, that have the Torah, and there are benefits that come with that, like the land of Israel. It's, it's, it's good. You'll have a certain degree of protection. Now, there's also, some, there's also some problematic aspects because being the nation of God, being the chosen nation, also means that you have to follow a certain path. If you veer too far off the path, God will nudge you back to the proper path. And those nudges, God's nudges are somet- sometimes shall we say, unpleasant. And that, that's a pattern that we see throughout our history is that when the Jewish people veer too far off from the, na- the, the path of the chosen nation, they have a certain flexibility within that path and they get a little bit off the path, hopefully they get back on the path themselves. They get too far off, they get shoved back on, on, on the path. Now, that's, it's good because it keeps us focused. It's bad because it's painful, but it also means that we're going to be around forever. Well, there are a lot of mega nations that were very, very powerful that seem to be invincible but are gone because they don't have this godly protection that will remain forever. But essentially what God is telling Abraham is that because you're a servant of me and because you're committed to upholding these ideals and to bringing God into the world, therefore I'm going to give your offspring that same stature to be this nation. However, as a prerequisite of this plan and this promise – they're going to have to be slaves to Pharaoh and Egypt and suffer under his cruel rule for hundreds of years. I think, given what we know, this really fits into the bigger picture. The Jewish people were golden. What does it mean that we're golden? It means that we were committed to God. But it was slightly unrefined gold. It wasn't perfect. And to be the chosen nation is to be perfect. 
or at least perfect at the inception. And therefore, God says, you're going to have to be slaves to Pharaoh and become total slaves to Pharaoh to become so dependent upon him that you can't even imagine any other life. Pharaoh's dominion is going to permeate every aspect of your life. Moshe comes and promises freedom, falls in deaf ears. Freedom does, doesn't register in your mind. You're total slaves to Pharaoh. And these centuries of servitude and enslavement are going to pen- penetrate them so completely that they're going to become absolute slaves of Pharaoh. What's the Exodus? The Exodus, that's the grand transformation of the status of the nation. Some things will change and some things won't change. What won't change is the fact that the Jewish people were servants of Pharaoh and they remain servants, even post the Exodus. What will change is who is going to be their master. Prior, they were total servants of Pharaoh, completely, absolute slavery. At the foot of the mountain, once the completion of this whole process of transformation of Exodus is brought to its culmination, they remain that same commitment to their master, but their master changed. Now they're servants of God. Thus, in essence, this 400-year process was to make them into total slaves, first to Pharaoh, but once they are, they have that mindset, they could just transfer their allegiance from Pharaoh to God. They recognize that Pharaoh is nothing more than a puppet controlled by a higher power. And thus, when they see Pharaoh being judged and being humbled by his master, by God, they are able to facilitate the transformation from allegiance to Pharaoh to allegiance to God. And thus, when you read about the whole Exodus story, all the plagues, all the miracles, everything that happens, and we see... So Pharaoh will know that I am God. Who cares about Pharaoh? What's the relevance of Pharaoh? Pharaoh is an afterthought. Pharaoh is the bad guy who is enslaving the Jewish people. It's critical that Pharaoh knows that I am God. It becomes undeniable to anyone that Pharaoh is subject to God because, not because of Pharaoh, the ultimate objective of that is for the Jewish people. The Jewish people have to see, wait a minute, we thought Pharaoh was the be-all end-all. Turns out, He is nothing. He is totally dominated by God. Oh, there's a higher power. Pharaoh himself is a slave of God, is totally, has no ability to resist and reject and rebel against God. He's totally under God's dominion. Well, okay, what does that mean about us? It means that we too should be totally under God's dominion as well. So in essence, it's important that Pharaoh knows that Hashem is in charge, not for Pharaoh, but for the Jewish people. And the commentary is right very extensively. Almost every commentary on the Torah understands the 10 plagues as being an entire lesson to build the emuna and the faith and the spiritual nature of the Jewish people. For example, one of the common commentaries says that if you look at the first three Of the 10, they're all subterranean. They all begin underground. The next three are ground level, and the the third three are from above, and the final one is life and death. And thus, in each one of these realms where the people previously had seen Pharaoh as a demigod, now they see that the Almighty is really in charge. And thus, it's necessary to have all 10 of them. It's not just a means to allow, to force Pharaoh's hand to send the Jewish people out. No, it's an education of Pharaoh and the Jewish people of who really is in charge and who is worthy of our commitment and our devotion. So so what's the result? God tells Abraham, when they leave, they're going to leave with great wealth. Now, of course, if you read the story, Moshe tells the Jewish people, everyone go to your neighbor, borrow their their gold and the silver and, and their utensils, just borrow it for our trip. We'll give it back to you later. And, of course, they took it, and it was justly theirs, and there was so much booty that they they cleaned house in Egypt. In fact, the Talmud tells us, just as a side note, that many, many years later, Alexander the Great presided over a tribunal 
where the Egyptians came and said to Alexander, read the Torah. The Torah says they plunder all the wealth. Give us all the money back. And the Jewish people responded, okay, but the Torah also says that you were enslaved for 400 years. Where did you pay for that? Pay for us for that. And the Egyptians says, give us three days to come up with their answer. And of course, they didn't. There's no answer. Uh, and as quite simply, you would say that this great wealth that is being talked about with, with Abraham's promise is the great wealth of the actual material goodness that the Jewish people murdered. But I think there's maybe a, di- a deeper point here. We're told that the Egyptian exile, the Egyptian exile and Egyptian experiment was about, was com- comparable to an iron crucible that takes unrefined gold and makes it refined. Great wealth. Perhaps the deeper meaning of this promise to Abraham is that the Jewish people will leave with great wealth, not necessarily material wealth, but spiritual wealth, because now they're going to be this chosen nation of God, and they're going to have all the eternal spiritual benefits from this exodus that really is connected. It's not just, oh, you'll be enslaved, oh, but don't worry, you'll also leave with great wealth. And those two are unrelated. No, it's it's one continuous process. You're going to be enslaved by Pharaoh. You're going to learn to become total slaves. And that will all engender the future exodus, which is the great wealth, which is this Jewish nation, which is the idealized version of what we should become and what we did become at the foot of the mountain. So what happens? Jews will get to Mount Sinai. And God says, okay, I have all these commandments to give you. And what do they say? They don't say, give me a list and let me see which one I want to opt into. They say, nah, seven ishma, we will do and we will listen. Who says such a thing? Someone who's a total servant of God. Someone who says, I don't have a personal say. I cannot, I cannot dictate what I'm going to accept and what I'm not going to accept. At the mountain, that really symbolizes what the nation really is at their, at their greatest. And thus, kind of, we, we get a whole picture of what the role is of the Egyptian enslavement and the entire exodus and the entire transformation that happened is all that is made the Jewish people into a, a nation of slaves, transfer them into be slaves of God, and now you can have Torah, and now you can fulfill your destiny that Abraham began. So how do we commemorate this? So first of all, like we said, every mitzvah really. What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is a Jew doing the will of God that God told him, and the Jew says, I have no option. I just have to obey. Thus, really, every Shabbos, what does Shabbos have to do with the Exodus? Shabbos talks about the six days of creation. The answer is, is that really every mitzvah has within it a scintilla of the Exodus in it, because the Exodus is when we became a nation that can observe mitzvahs, that wants to observe mitzvahs, that is committed. We're the pure gold now that says, God, tell us what to do. Let's, let's obey your will. But moreover, we have, we have, for example, I think that this, these fundamental insights really explain a lot of the somewhat bizarre aspects of the holiday. So, for example, we're told that matzah, matzah the, the, the holiday itself is called the Chag HaMatzos, the festival of matzos. That's the eponymous mitzvah of the holiday. Well, what's a matzah? So, if you read the Haggadah, and you read the Torah, it says, when the Jewish people left Egypt, they were in such a huge rush to leave that the leaven wasn't able to kick in and the dough didn't rise. And therefore, all they had were these flat crackers. That's what the Torah says. And that's what, in fact, we say in the Haggadah as well. Problem is, the very first snippet of the Haggadah talks about the matzah. You're supposed to reveal the matzah. And you say, ha lachma anya. This is the poor person's bread. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. So when the Jewish people were in Egypt, not when they left, when they were in Egypt, this is what they ate matzah. So wait a minute, is it it the bread of affliction or is it it the bread of freedom? Is it the bread that they ate in Egypt when they were slaves? Or is it the bread that they ate when they left Egypt when they were enslaved, when they were freed? Seems to be a contradiction. Which one is it? The answer is, of course, that matzah is the food before and after the redemption. It's the same kind of food. Why? Because matzah is the bread of slaves, and our status as slaves did not change with the exodus. We continue to eat this same bread even afterwards because now we too are slaves, so to speak. We're servants, not a pharaoh. 
but of God. There's something that did not change with the Exodus. Something that did, something that did not. What didn't is the matzah. It's the matzah that our parents ate when they were slaves of Pharaoh, and it's the matzah that our parents ate when they were slaves of God, because it's, it's, bread, it's bread of slaves. And really, the matzah is the one, the constant. What, what is constant is the fact that we are slaves. And what's not is the fact that we were slaves of Pharaoh, and that's a terrible thing, because we're slaves of slaves. What is Pharaoh? Pharaoh is nothing but a puppet. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Pharaoh doesn't even have control of his own actions. Really, God has control of everything. And that's the bad kind of matzah. And then there's a good kind of matzah. Okay, God really is in control. And the human reaches their, their, their highest greatness when they submit themselves to God. And the Jewish nation reached their greatness when they, at the foot of the mountain, accepted God's commandments. And I think this really, again, shows the broadness of the themes of Pesach. You know, Pharaoh is not the only false master whose chains must be broken. In Jewish literature, there is an idea called the false god, or called the phony god, or the faux god, or the pauper god. Talmud tells us in the book of Shabbos, lo yihye becha el zar. It's a verse in the Torah. You should not have within you a false god, or a foreign god. Ask the Talmud, wait a minute, the foreign god is like a little figurine put in the corner of the room or hang up and you bow down to it. It's not within you. It's within your house, within your communities, within your lifestyle. What does this mean? Where's this foreign god that's within a person? Says the Talmud, this is referring to the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination. The evil inclination is the false god. What this is telling us, a very deep insight, that Pharaoh was not the only false god vying for our allegiance. He was the one in yesteryear, and we transferred that to the Almighty through the Exodus and at Sinai. But in essence, this is an ongoing conflict because every human is given a, an evil inclination within them. And what does the evil inclination do? It dictates like a deity. It tells the Jew or the human, respective, tells everyone how to behave. It says, do this, and dutifully, the person obeys. It says, do that, and again, we're like total slaves of this foreign god. And in Jewish literature, it talks about really the conflict that we have. For example, on Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is the day of the coronation of God. And part of the prayers are comparing the Almighty with the evil inclination. That one of them is the supreme God and one is the lowly God. One is the real king and one is the pretender. And that is an ongoing conflict. So in essence, the the conflict that existed in Egypt and the redemption that we got at the Exodus is ongoing battle within each and every one of us. That is that we have a foreign God within us and we just obey whatever he wants us to do. And that is in conflict with the Almighty. So Pharaoh was the initial foreign god, and now there's a new foreign god. And thus, the struggle continues. And again, the objective is to remain a slave, but not of your internal foreign master. Instead, to be dedicated to the ultimate power that is the engine behind everything, including Pharaoh and including the internal foreign master. So this, again, it spans the relevance of, of Pesach and the Pesach story, the Pesach transformation to every mitzvah. What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is man choosing to obey the directives of God. By doing that, man is freeing him or herself from the bonds of the internal master, the foreign master that exists within each and every one of us. And thus, all mitzvahs really are a little bit of the personal exodus, where you're previously enslaved to a foreign master, now you're enslaved to God. Every mitzvah is a minor Yitzhak Mitzrayim leaving Egypt, because every mitzvah is an act that you are doing because God tells you in opposition to the will of your foreign master, and thus you are now a little bit more of a slave of God and less of a slave of your Yetzer Hara. So, for example, the Talmud tells us, 
to kind of bring this all together, that there was a great sage who would pray every day. When he finished praying, he would say, Master of the world, it's well known that we, that we really want to do your will. Really, the Jew wants to do the will of God. But two things are stopping us. The yeast in the bread and the submission of foreign kings. We really want to do the will of God. It's just a, there's a problem. There's yeast in the bread. Very bizarre. So all the commentators explain the yeast in the bread is a euphemism for the Yitzhara, for the evil inclination. Yeast in the bread is also the exact same agent that turns that turns matzah into chametz. And of course, matzah is the mitzvah of Pesach. The struggle of the Egyptian agile is ongoing. What is stopping us from being total slaves of God, being total slaves either of Pharaoh or being total slaves of the Yetzirah? And that, again, is the struggle that is underpinning every aspect of Torah. Who is your master? You are certainly, there's no way you're on, you're on the dominion of nothing. It's either God or it's a foreign God. That's the question. And to the degree that you're submit, submitted to the foreign God, you're not submitted to God. And that indeed is an ongoing struggle. And that's why we revisit this mitzvah. Every time we almost, so many mitzvahs we say, Zechel, it's Yitzvah, as I remember for, for, for the Exodus, it's on our doorposts, it's on our tefillin, it's part of our prayers, it's every Shabbos, it's every holiday, everything. Because that's what a mitzvah is. A mitzvah is nudging a person a little bit towards being committed to God. So for example, we have the holiday of Shavuos. 50 days after the holiday of Passover. And of course, they're connected by the counting of the Omer. So we, we actually start counting from the second day of Pesach until Shavuos. We're counting the days leading up to it, which seems to demonstrate that there is a connection between these two festivals. Now, the Ramban, Nachmanides, he says that just like on Pesach, there's seven days of Pesach, there's it's really eight days, but that's a separate discussion. I gave a talk about this uh, recently. Check it out. The Jewish History Podcast, the history of the Jewish calendar, why seven days became eight days. But there's the days in the beginning and there's days in the, in the end. And then there's the intermediate days. Says the Ramban, Pesach is like the first holiday and Shavuos is the second holiday, the second half of the same holiday. And the intermediate days are the days of the Omer. That's what he says. It's like one long 50-day holiday. What does this mean? It means that these two festivals are connected and they're intimately connected. Well, what's the holiday of, of Shavuos about? It's about the accepting the Torah. What's the holiday of Pesach about? Well, that's about the redemption from Egypt. Now we see how they're exactly one and the same. We're freeing ourselves from the bondage to Pharaoh and we're embracing the bondage to God. That's part of one holistic transformation that happens over the course of these 50 days. Moreover, what what what, what is the Torah? The Torah is called the Instructions of Freedom. You don't have a free man other than someone who observes Torah. Now, if you read that and you look at Torah, you say, wait a minute, that seems to be oxymoronic. The Torah is all about all these rules, what you can do, what you cannot do. It doesn't seem to be the guidebook for the free person. It seems to be the guidebook for the sub- sub- subjected person, submitted person. And the answer is yes. Of course, that's true. That you, when you're embracing Torah, you're looking at the instructions of God. But necessarily, if you're embracing the directives of God, you are freeing yourself from the foe God. And what this again is telling us, deep insight, you are regardless submitted to some power. The question is, is it a real power or is it a fake power? Is it the real God or is it the foreign God? And thus, by embracing Torah, you're freeing yourself either from submission to Pharaoh, who was a total farce, or submission to the foreign god, which, again, is a total farce as well. And thus, you're achieving freedom because really true freedom is to be free of foreign masters, not of true masters. And thus, we see completion between these two holidays because they are part two parts, two halves of the same transformation. And on a deeper level, we're told in the more 
mystical sources. And the only reason I'm saying this, we don't talk about mystical sources here, but it's so well known, it became kind of part of the non-mystical realm of Torah. We're told that the Jewish people, that there's 49, well, there's really 50 gates, so to speak, of purity. Bless you. There's 50 gates of purity and there's 50 gates of impurity. And each one of these days, they are leading from a day, from a, unlocking a gate of purity and freeing themselves from a gate of impurity. And thus, they needed these 50 days to totally clear the system of any influence of Pharaoh and embrace another module of of God's commitment. And thus, after 49 days, day 50, they could have the Torah. They could have this completion, this completion of two worlds. They have freed themselves, so to speak, of any influence of this world's dominion, and that unlocks for them the spiritual world, and thus they could get Torah from that world. How do we maximize our festival, our Pesach? So there is a part of the Haggadah that my grandfather every year would, would highlight. It talks about that uh, we used to be slaves, but now we are close to God. It doesn't say that, na- that at this point in the year our ancestors were close to God. It says now we are close to God. What this is telling us is that at this spiritual juncture of the year on Pesach, there is a closeness that exists between the Jewish nation and every individual and God. Now, on a deeper level, what this means is that there was something really special that happened. There was a revelation that happened on the eve of the Exodus at midnight when God revealed himself to the world. And that kickstarted the the Exodus. Every year, the Jewish calendar revisits that day, but also that spiritual experience. And therefore, we can say, and now, in, in modern times, God brought us close to him because of the fact that we are reliving that same experience. My grandfather would always say, on this point, he would say that every year we are revisiting not just the calendar, but the same spiritual power is present in the world on these days. And therefore, on this night of Pesach, in one fell swoop, the Jewish nation who were slaves of Pharaoh became slaves of God. So there's a remarkable potency in this day to transform servants of fire and God to servants of God, which is to achieve the objective of, of life, essentially, according to Judaism. And therefore, on Pesach, there is a different system of how we accomplish things. If you want to do, you want to build your spiritual world manually, it's a lot of hard work because you have a Yetzirah, and you have Torah, and the Yetzirah is very, very efficacious. And you got to fight, and you got to struggle, and it's difficult, and it's hard work, and it's not easy. And it is, it's a grind. And every, you hopefully do two steps forward, maybe one step back, but you keep on plunging ahead. And a whole year of such work, Maybe you'll you'll move in a way that's appreciable, that, that that's significant, that's tangible, and over the course of the lifetime, hopefully we'll get we'll become great people. Pesach, there's different rules. This notion of one step at a time, one foot in front of the next, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. All those things thrown out the window. Pesach is especially the eve of Pesach, the night of the Seder. That is the time where we can accomplish great leaps with small effort. On this night, overnight, we're transformed. Now, granted, the following day, they were back to square one and they had to have 49 days to manually reach that point. But at a minimum, the work of 49 days happened for them in in one hour. But really, it's the work of a lifetime happened in one hour. And that's why we, we see this tremendous emphasis of this night. We have the, the Haggadah and the Launch Seder and every, all the symbolism and all the insights that we're trying to absorb on this holiday 
are all there to maximize the opportunity of Pesach and to think about what happened to our ancestors, but not to just look back, to look at ourselves. And just like we're inspecting the whole house for chametz, we have to inspect our own hearts for this proverbial leavened bread and to find the areas where God is not dominant within us and to use this holiday to catapult ourselves forward in our pursuit of accomplishing what it is that we need to do. Just as an aside, my grandfather used to explain, so why did the firstborn die? There's this, at the same time of this transformation, the firstborn are dying. And he says something very powerful, a very little counterintuitive. We know that the firstborn, in, in certainly in, in Jewish philosophy, has greater spiritual acuity. That's what we're told. And therefore, God reveals himself in the world. And that's, of course, it's not natural. It's not like we earned it. It was just by dint of the day. God revealed himself in the world. The firstborn, they have the spiritual antennae to absorb that because they're more spiritually perceptible. And therefore, they're not able to absorb it and they just combust. They die. God shields the firstborn of the Jewish people so they are saved, even though they too are not worthy of absorbing it. But what does that show? That shows that God is revealing himself in this world without our action, without us earning it, and that is revisited every year. And every Pesach, we say, okay, there is this rush of spiritual power available. How much of it can we grab? We don't need to earn it. We don't need to draw it down. We just have to open up our pockets and allow them to be filled up. Normally, it's very hard on Pesach. It's very easy. It still demands some work, but the entire Seder, the entire Haggadah, and all those meanings behind everything we do are all designed to get us to maximize the opportunity. So my hope and my blessing is to everyone that we make use of this tremendous opportunity that we have upcoming, the holiday of Pesach, the holiday where we again revisit what we stand for as a nation, what we're striving to achieve as a people, what the objective of Torah is. It gives us meaning not only to the Exodus, but also to the preceding suffering. We're learning about what we stand for as a people, as a Jew. The Jew is the servant of God. That's what we heard at Sinai. That's what we became at the Exodus. We transferred from being servants of Pharaoh to servants of God. And that work is ongoing. We are continually trying to free ourselves from the shackles of the foreign God. Hopefully, Pesach, we will take that great leap forward in getting closer to the ideal and the perfection that we are striving to achieve.